If you could rise your feet in honor of God's word, we're coming from the book of James. We're going to lift up verse 7 from our Psalmonic text. But um, I'm going to preach from the 7th through the 10th verse. Lord laid it on my heart that um, we've been in the book of James in Bible study. And we've been in the book of James... Um, to this morning and we'll be in the book of James on Wednesday night again uh, the Lord just laid it on my heart just to look at James and just in case somebody didn't notice G James is the half brother of Jesus and he became the bishop of the church in Jerusalem later on after he came to faith and to give you the background of James he wasn't a believer he called his brother Jesus crazy they were telling him to me, Jesus needs to be quiet. You, you're acting, acting foolish. You're embarrassing us. You're embarrassing the family. So you get the background that at some point in time in your life, and since this is Pentecost, when you hear the name of Jesus and then you recognize what he has done, you can change your life around. You can turn your life around. We, we were talking about it the other night. The Bible said about doing that one, not one, not 360, but a 180, which means if you're heading this way, true repentance means when you see the sin coming, you go this way. St. Augustine said he saw his girlfriend, his woman that he was cheating with, coming at him. And he says, I must flee, my love. And she said, why? Because you are my sin and I must repent and go the other way. So if St. Augustine could say that, then we can do the same thing as well. And he is one of the lauded um, founding fathers in the church as well. If you haven't, say amen. And it reads as follows. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm going to read it again. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Please be seated and pray with me now. Father, we thank you for this day once again, Lord. You, you placed me here in this pulpit to preach your word, Lord. Stand up in me. Let my congregation see you and not see me. But rise up and be greater and use me, Lord, to your to your purpose as your vessel, Lord. We th I thank you in advance for that somebody that whosoever want to give their life to Christ. Right now, Lord, this is the time where we preach. This is the time where we're, we're using your word to convict someone, to move someone, to change someone's heart to reflect you, Jesus. So I pray now that someone, when they hear your word, cries out and says, I yield, I yield, and want to give my life over to Christ. I thank you for this darling congregation that you place in front of me, before me, Lord. Strengthen me to preach your word where I'm torn down, build me up, why I'm broken, Lord, strengthen me. I thank you now in your son Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. One more time. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Resist the devil, and he will flee. I like to speak from the thought this morning, the resistant movement, the resistance movement. Turn and smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, are you on the Lord's side? Now, let me give you a little background about the word resistance. It's the act or power of resisting, opposing or withstanding. It can also mean an underground organization composed of groups of private individuals working as an opposition force in a conquered country to overthrow the occupying power, usually by acts of sabotage and guerrilla warfare. And that's where I'm going to operate from, from that definition this morning. You see, during World War II, there was an estimated 500,000 French men and women who worked for the resistance, the French resistance, during the German occupation of France. Let me give you a side note. The Polish Home Army was also the largest resistant anti-Nazi movement to fight against the Nazis in occupied Europe as well. And let me be clear, resistance workers carried out thousands of acts of sabotage against the German occupiers, ranging from guerrilla warfare to distributing anti-Nazi literature. But here's the thing about it, the downside was, Michael, their work was extremely hazardous. There was brutal reprisals, indiscriminate killing. The risk was great. More than 90,000 resistors were tortured, deported, or killed. My job this morning is to recruit you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, for the CRM. 
I want you to be, be members of the CRM, the Christian Resistance Movement. Men, women, and children present that are willing to stand for Jesus, and you may already be a member, but don't even know it yet. But why? Because you're living a lifestyle that is acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. And while you're living in this world, you are resisting those temptations that might lead you down the path of destruction. We're all in a struggle. Remember what Peter said. He tells us in Peter, he says, we're nothing but pilgrims passing through this world on our Christian journey, on our way home to heaven. We are to live in this world, but not participate in the sinful activities of this world. The things that compromise our values, our lives, and our way of walk. We have to be like the French and Polish resistance movements. We are in the fight for our lives. We are in a fight for our families, the souls, for everyone we come in contact with, for those who aren't saved. Our job is to fight. But while we are fighting, we must resist. We must fight on. We must struggle. Because our enemy is cunning. Miss Yvonne, our enemy is devious. Richard, our enemy is a liar. He's very deceptive. Miss Julie, he's a thief. Steve, he's a murderer. At the first chance he gets, he's going to steal your joy and try to kill you all in the same process. You see, Miss Lorraine, he's so good at what he does, he'll have you thinking your worst day is your best day. And that whatever you're doing, you don't need Jesus in your life because what you're doing is is always the right thing. And if you think I'm lying, just ask the prodigal son how well that worked for him. You see, the enemy I'm talking about is the devil. Look at the text, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So to help you fight, my friends, to help you defend, to put up your dukes and have victory over our enemy and join the resistance movement, I'd like to give you three for the Trinity to the glory of God. I'd like to give you my first point. You must submit to God and suppress the devil. It's that simple. You must submit to God and suppress the devil. Brother Dale, you remember being in, 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 in the military. One of the things we had to do was fire, suppress a fire on the enemy. And when you fire a large amount of rounds at a target, it's to keep the enemy's head down or to hopefully hit and kill him. But the thing is, our enemy, the devil, we have to use suppressive fire for him. But we also have to submit to God first. The verse says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So how do I submit to God? First, let me tell you this. Until you submit yourselves to Jesus, over his, to his authority over your life, you don't have a chance in this fight, my friends. You must be. You got to be born again. If you have not made Jesus the Lord over your life, then the fight against the devil you have already lost. You see, Miss Ashley, let me be clear about one thing. When you place Jesus and call on Jesus and submit to Jesus, then the battle has already been won. When Jesus rose from the grave on Easter morning, the devil had lost the battle. And thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. But brothers and sisters, in case you don't know, every born again believer fights from a position of victory. You see, Miss Pat, we need to stop living like victims and live like the victors that we are. Amen? Let me tell you why we live, should live like victors. All because what Jesus did on that cross, we have victory. All because what Jesus did by walking out of the grave, we have victory. Hold up that bloodstained banner. Shout hallelujah to the king. Give God glory and I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will always be in my mouth. Vince, look again. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Submission begins and ends with your confession of faith and belief in Jesus as your Savior, Romans 10, 9. Second, it begins with trusting and having faith in God's plan for your life, Jeremiah 29, 11. Lastly, having complete and absolute faith in God, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Mr. 
better. It says, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. You see, Miss Trish, friends, when we do these things, God's got your back. Even though the devil will attack you, you let God fight your battles. Help me out here, somebody. Remember King Jehoshaphat, we, I talk about him a lot. He didn't lift one finger to fight his enemies. God defeated all his enemies. All King Jehoshaphat had to do was praise God, and God did the fighting, and he won. But how do I fight the pastor, devil? How do I fight, how do I fight the devil, pastor? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> With the most powerful weapon ever made. You see, we got nuclear bombs. We got 2,000-pound bombs. We got all kind of bombs. But the most powerful weapon ever made is the Word of God. That's where we get the suppressive fire. We keep shooting at the devil with the Word of God. We keep shooting at the devil with the Word of God. You see, 1 John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Say it with the sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. He is the living word that makes the devil flee. Brothers and sisters, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing, watch this now, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What that means is this. When we use the word of God against the, our enemy, it makes him a captive, it makes him a loser, it makes him a defeated foe. The living word of God is Jesus, is, is God's son Jesus. He defeated the devil. As a matter of fact, he gave us an example to follow. Matthew 4, 11 and 1, he used nothing but scripture to deter the devil. The scripture he took was Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 8. And in that chapter there, in, in Matthew, it says that the devil left him alone for a time. And you notice that when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the devil always came back. His disciples, the Pharisees and Sadducees and demons, always came back and they always did what? Harassed and bothered and attacked Jesus. But he used the word of God to fight the devil every time and the devil walked away a loser. Now, let me say this, friends. If you know the word of God, you can use the word of God as your weapon to fight the devil. But if you don't know, you haven't read, you don't pick up your Bible, or you don't believe, then you're fighting the devil with a water gun when he has a machine gun, you're going to lose. But if you know, say his name again with me, Jesus, and his love, his word in Ephesians 6.17 says, take up the helmet of salvation. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When you drive in your car and the cop pulls you over, he asks you for your driver's license. He asks you for your registration and proof of insurance. But if you have your Bible on the front seat, you might want to let him know you have a deadly weapon in your car and it might be used. Prayer. The word of God plus your faith, you stand in victory, my friends. How do we do this? We resist the devil. Use the word to suppress him. Look at what the text says. What the devil will do. He will bring you to dinner. He will give you a hug. He will have a tickle fight with you. No. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Oh, and by the way, he's not running from you. He's fleeing from God. James 2.18 says, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even demons believe and tremble. Matter of fact, demons got better on theology than some Christians because we get a little shaky and quaky in our faith sometimes. We start to believe in God and then we start to doubt God. But if demons tremble, if demons flee, if demons are scared of our Lord and Savior, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. We're protected by Jesus. Now, you've got to do some things in your life. You've got to make some changes. You've got to clean some things up. And once you come to faith in Christ, remain faithful. He'll fight every battle for you if you just keep your little busy self still and believe in Him. Look at the text, verse 8. It says... 
draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is why I'd like to give you my second point. You must draw closer to God for him to cleanse you. You must draw closer to God for him to cleanse you. The verse says, draw nigh. That means near. The, the word nigh means draw near. And he'll draw near to you. But look at the things we have to do. Cleanse our hands. Remind ourselves that we aren't perfect, but we are what? Sinners. Then we got to clean up some things in our lives. When the Bible said at his heart, it's not referring to the cardio, but to the psychology, the psycho. We got to think about our minds, our hearts. What is our minds on? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. It says that ye double-minded. If the requirement for us to have victory means to draw closer to God, then why do we love the things of this world more than we do Jesus? Why? Why, Richard? Why? Why, why is that? Why? Somebody, Miss Pat, tell me why. You see, here's how you know if you love something. Truly love something. There's three ways to test that. The money you spend on it, the time you spend with it, and you can't live without it. Marinate on those things, my friends. Because these three, three things are the litmus test on to know if you love Jesus or not. Do you pay your tithes and offering? That's spending your money. But you're doing it in the Lord's house. How much time do you, or how often do you spend time in prayer, private devotion, attend Bible study, come to church? That's the time you spend with something. Can you live without God? Can you live without Jesus in your life? Many of us act like we like God, but not love him. Because we haven't done the first two things first. I'm going to say that again. We act like we like God, but don't really act like we love God because we haven't done the first two things first. We ain't spent the proper money with him. We don't pay our tithes or we don't spend time with him. Yeah. We haven't done those things. So our behavior acts like we can we can live without him. So how are you going to draw closer to God? 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Come out from among them. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. You've got to let some of those things go. And here's why. What you've established as the things you love more than God is your idol. I'm going to say that again. We all know what idols are. The thing that you depend on to provide for you is substitute for God who provides everything for you. We believe that he supplies all our needs according to his riches and glory. But when we put an idol in God's place, we're telling God that our idol will supply all our needs, all the things we desire, everything we need for protection. We're telling God that the idol will take care of us. You see, we serve a God that will not tolerate, does not like competition. He don't want to compete for your attention. He deserves all the praise and to give him all the glory. Friends, we are told not to love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. Also, it says that you have made God, you become enemies with God. Ooh, pause for a second. Think about that. You just became an enemy of God when you tell God that you love the world more than him. Now, I don't want to fight God. My arms are too short to box with him. But if you love God, if you love the world, he has no obligation to watch over you, protect you. He turns you over to your idol, God, to do that job that he's supposed to do. You see, you decide to pin on that idol to supply all your needs. Tell me how well that's working for you, as Dr. Phil was saying. Look at the text again. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Look at what happens when you draw near to God. He'll come closer. You will come in his presence. I remember a story clearly about when Moses had spent so much time with God that the Shekinah glory was on him so much so that he had to put a, a, a mask, a, a, a cloth over his face so that it wouldn't scare the people because he shined from the glory of God. He got a God burn, not a sun burn, but a God burn. 
When you have a close relationship with someone, you just want to be closer to them. Not far from the one you love, but closer to them. You see, everyone in the Bible that had a close relationship with God didn't want to be away from his presence. David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Jeremiah said, when he quit on God, he said, the word of God was like a fire shut up in my bones. But one of my favorite stories is Enoch had such a close relationship with God that when he was on a walk with God, God said, hey man, let's just pull over right here. If you were a little closer to my house than your house, so instead of you going home, Come on up to my house and stay with me forever. Amen? And he did just that. Enoch was with God. Everyone that ever had a relationship with Jesus didn't want to be separated from him. That's why his disciples wept on the day he was crucified. They wept when the tomb was empty, but they didn't know how to figure it out because they didn't know if his body was stolen, but they forgot what Jesus told them. He was going to rise on the third day. And then when he just got back, they wept again because he said, hey, guess what? I'm going to be with my father. And so when he rose again to heaven, they were crying again. Boy, if tears of joy and sorrow because they were going to miss the one they loved. Let me be clear. You can't live without Jesus. He's the bread of heaven. You can't live without Jesus. He's the living water. You can't live without Jesus. He is everything we need to have life and have it more abundantly. Look at the text. Look at the cleansing. Verse 8 again. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We can't live any old way as Christians. We have standards. We have a way of living. Our lifestyle does not agree with the world. You see, these standards are based upon what the Bible says, not the laws of a nation, not the laws of a state, not the laws of a city or a county, but what the Word of God has established. Some laws are in agreement with God. Some laws. For example, thou shalt not kill. We have laws for murder that's right and moral and agrees with God. But we have laws that says you can do drugs for recreation. Not medication, recreation. The state can legalize doing drugs, but what does God say about being sober-minded, my friends? What does God say about being in control of your body? Romans 6, 12, and 13 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey is what? Lust. Verse 13 goes on to say what we should be thinking about. Don't present your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Let me translate that into English. Have self-control. Don't use your body or let your body be used for sin. Just because it feels good. Present yourselves to God as a person who is righteous. You see, Miss Ashley, the text says, cleanse your hands. Miss Ivy, it says, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You see, remember when COVID was crazy and we were all afraid of COVID? We washed our hands a million times a day. God had already had a plan for COVID already in the Bible. Look at the text again. Cleanse your hands. That was God's plan for COVID right there. Sinners, purify what? Your heart, meaning your mind. Stop flip-flopping around saying you love Jesus, but you love the world more. You double-minded. Choose God or choose the world. You can't love the world and say you love God. James tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, meaning he lacks self-control. He's out of control. That's a nice, polite way of saying you're crazy. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Either you love one or hate the other. James is telling you and he's telling me it's time to clean up. It's time to clean up your dirty mind, your dirty lifestyle, your dirty heart from hate, your dirty mouth from lying, cursing and gossiping. It's time to clean up your cheating and your dirty dealing. Whatever sin is separating you from God, God says be ye holy because I am holy. F friends, it's cleanup time. It's cleanup time. Everybody needs to clean up. How do I know that? 
Let me put some Bible to that. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And just to reconfirm about who's doing that washing, who's doing the cleaning, it is Jesus. Let me tell you who Jesus is by Revelations 1 and 5. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to whom, to him whom loved us and washed us from our sins. Have mercy. Somebody should have shot right there. But here's the best part. When he washed us from our sins, it was in his own blood. Come on, give God some glory right now. Come on, give God some glory right now. Come on, give God some glory. Let us review our first point. You must submit to God and suppress the devil. Brother Dale, lay down that cover and fire with the word of God. The devil attacks you. He attacks your mind, attacks your heart, attacks your family. Put down that cover and fire with the word of God. Second point, you must draw closer to God for him to cleanse you. Let him clean you up. If we could clean ourselves up, then we wouldn't be posting that cross up there on the wall. It would be done by our works. That's why it says we are, we, we are saved by faith. All right? Not by our works that any man should boast. Only person we can boast in is what the works of Jesus did on that cross. My third and final point. You will exchange some good things for some painful things. You'll exchange some good things for some painful things, but God will exalt you in due time. God will exalt you. He'll lift you up. That's what the word exalt means. He'll take you higher. Verses 9 and 10. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Look at the exchange. Meaning, you've got to give up something and you'll get something else in return. You may not like what you're going to get because it will hurt. But all growth and maturity hurts. Baby teeth. Got to be pulled. Got to be pulled. And here's why. It's to allow the adult teeth to come in. Legs get longer. Friends, waists get a little wider. And we might have to buy some new clothes. That's the trade. When we have maturity and growth. But look at what we trade. First, we're going to be afflicted. We're going to mourn. We're going to weep for two reasons. First, we're giving up the things we like. It's called withdrawal. Everyone goes through it because you love this world for so long that the things or whatever things you like, they start to talk to you. I want you to come back to me. You can't live without me. The things that you love about this world, that's why the lies come from the devil. That's why you must resist. Use the word to suppress and be cleansed and be clean. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now, your laughter, the things you used to laugh at, the dirty jokes ain't funny no more because you changed your mind. You might miss it. You might like those old jokes, but now your mind has changed. You have a mind of Christ. Your joy to heaviness because what used to make you happy, not joyful, happy doesn't make you happy anymore. You found out that the things wasn't really joyful because it was a false sense of happiness because you once found Jesus. Now you know what true joy is. Now that you found Jesus, you know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The second reason for your affliction Watch this. Now your lifestyle reflects your love for Jesus. Friends, you have just become public enemy number one. 
You have a target on your back because you are now living for Jesus and not for the devil. So now the devil will attack you. But God will give you grace. Somebody say grace. Grace to resist. Grace to fight the good fight. Grace to suppress your own personal sinful desires. Grace to continue to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Somebody say grace again. Grace. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But once you humble yourself, look what God does for you. Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Now, I'm going to say something that might bother some people hard. Pastor, you just spoke against drugs. Yeah, I did. But do you know God wants to get you high? Let that marinate for a second. You know God wants to get you high? I know somebody doesn't believe me. Remember, Christians don't die. We what? We fly. Look at the text. He shall do what? He shall lift you up. He's going to lift you up. You're going higher. Higher in the Lord. Look at the text. I'm not making this up. When you get low, when you are humble yourself, Jesus sits up high and he's going to lift you what? What's the text say? He shall lift you what? Somebody say up. He's lifting you up. I got more scripture to back it up. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on eagles with wings. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Anybody see that Jesus can lift you up if he has to reach way down? You see, humble means to get low. You can't stumble if you are humble. I've never seen nobody praying on their knees, trip up and fall down. If you are on your knees, if you are low to the ground, God will lift you up. You see the scripture that I'm looking at. I'm not making this up. Randy, Psalm 30 and 1 says, I will exalt you, O Lord, for you have what? Lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. But then Psalm 42 says, he lifted me out of the pit of my despair, out of the mud and mire, and set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked. He lifted me up. But Sister Stewart, 1 Peter 5 and 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may do what? Exalt you in due time. You see, friends, in each of these scriptures, God is lifting us up. He's taking us higher, higher, and higher. And I'm reminded of a song by B.B. and C.C. Wine. Lord, lift us up where we belong, where the eagles fly on a mountain high. Lord, lift us up where we belong, up from the world we know, where the, where the winds clear and blow. The road may be long. Yes, the mountains may be in our way, but we're not going to worry because the Lord is with us on our way. We'll keep climbing, climbing still every higher every day. Lord, lift me up. Friends, when the devil attacks, remember why he's doing it. Because you belong to the resistance movement. You belong to Jesus. To God be the glory.